It's a great honor to be here. I'm uh, thankful to May Mahoney and the uh, organizing committee for uh, this, uh, uh, this real uh, pleasure and honor to come here and talk to you about mitochondria. For me, it's actually a double pleasure because I'm from Northwestern University, and uh, my good friend Kathy Green was honored uh, a couple of days ago, and I was able to uh, 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 rejoice and share her, uh, uh, her glory here. Uh, so as you can tell, I work on mitochondria. For most of you, when you hear mitochondria, it reminds you of that terrible time in your life, which is the biochemistry lectures about 25, 30, 40 years ago, depending on. And, uh, and, uh, but, uh, you know, mitochondria made a comeback, as many of you know, and I'm going to tell you uh, a little vignette about why they made a comeback. Uh, it's not all about energy and powerhouse. As you can tell by my title, uh, it says that mitochondria are uh, signaling organelles. Uh, so that's already telling you something different. So what I thought I'd do today is, is two things real quick. The first is just give you like a 10-minute commercial about what mitochondria are doing these days, and then give you one example about the uh, skin biology, obviously, eh, that sort of highlight uh, some basic conceptual points. So just to remind you, mitochondria have two functions. One, they're a bioenergetic organelle. After all, their coin is the powerhouse of the cell. It's the only part of our mitochondria that we don't work on. We think this is the most boring part of our mitochondria. I'll come back to it in a second. Um, and the other part is it's a biosynthetic organelle. Many people forget that mitochondria, especially the TCA cycle in mitochondria, makes metabolites. And those metabolites can be building blocks for lipids, for nucleotides. They can make glucose for gluconeogenesis, right? And so it's also a biosynthetic organelle. Well, that's very a key to understanding mitochondrial function. And now, this is the only insight, uh, at least I've ever had in my life, which is the following one. It's not that insightful in retrospect, but uh, in the 90s when I was getting my uh, PhD, eh, uh, the, the, the conventional wisdom as how we look at biology was very simple, right? It, it, you have signals from the outside of a cell or the inside of a cell. Ultimately, you activate signal transduction pathways, many of the ones that many people work here, are PI3 kinase, is, uh, rho GTPases, et cetera. Uh, and eventually, everything goes to the nucleus to, to reprogram your genes, and then you differentiate or you proliferate or you migrate, et cetera, right? Okay. As a consequence of that phenotype, you need certain amount of energy and biosynthetic capabilities from the mitochondria. So obviously, the, then the nucleus dictates to the mitochondria, this is what I need. In this simple scheme, basically, you have a mitochondria in the background, always fit. It gives you whatever you need. It's almost in an autonomous way. It's just hanging out, right? But this never made sense to us. It would be like me getting in a car and never checking if I have enough fuel to go somewhere, right? And so just like in a car, when you turn it on, you have a bunch of checkpoints before a cell commits to any biological process, whether that's cellular differentiation, whether that's cell proliferation, et cetera. So in a very mitochondric-centric way of thinking about the universe, we have a simple hypothesis in my lab. Whatever the signal you give, whether it's a signal to proliferate, differentiate, it, uh, migrate, etc. that perhaps maybe you should go and just make sure your mitochondria are fit, right? A cell should never commit to a biological process without knowing if their mitochondria are fit. Because that's the worst place to be, because you're going to do something energetically and biosynthetically demanding, like cellular differentiation or cellular proliferation, without knowing if your mitochondria are fit. And if your mitochondria aren't fit, and you commit to that biological, uh, energetic, or biosynthetic demanding process, is that creates a mismatch between supply and demand, and you get either a pathology or you get death, right? And so we always thought that you should have uh, just a little gauge to make sure your mitochondria are fit. Right? And so how would a mitochondria let the rest of the cell know we're doing OK. So we started to look for signals emanating from mitochondria. Uh, and one of the ones that we thought about was maybe H2O2, right? Hydrogen peroxide. Now, this sounds like bleach chemistry. Uh, but uh, you know, uh, as, as Ethan was saying, our notion of H2O2 has quite evolved. And to be honest with you, uh, one of the first examples that we could show, oh, which surprised us, us, was at very nanomolar amounts of H2O2 endogenously being released from mitochondria could activate two very uh, 
uh, big biological effects, I would argue. One was the hypoxic induction of HIFs, hypoxia inducible factors. There's, the other one was NF kappa B, uh, uh, a major output of uh, uh, pro inflammatory signaling, right? Okay. And uh, it took us, as you was saying, quite some time to convince people that this actually. Uh, could actually happen. And, and in part, right, this is what we had to do to get all of our papers published. It, it, and the reason was, um, and for those of you who watched that great YouTube video, this is Reviewer 3. Um, and so, uh, uh, and the reason is the following, and which is that the conventional wisdom is that reactive oxygen species, hydrogen peroxide, superoxide, they damage, right? And in fact, the largest selling drugs and supplements for the last, I would argue, 50 years is, isn't statins, is, it isn't Viagra, it isn't, uh, uh, it isn't aspirin even, it's antioxidants, right? right? Antioxidants are a bonanza, they continue to be a bonanza. Uh, but when people have done rigorous clinical trials, antioxidants haven't really panned out. Now, either we haven't built the right antioxidant, or the idea about reactive oxygen species simply, sorry, let me just go back, uh, simply damaging in your lipids, your DNA, maybe there's, it's not quite all there, right? It's so so uh, the conventional wisdom is the reason you get diabetes, the reason we age, neurodegeneration, ischemia, is you make tons of ROS, and the ROS just somehow damage your lipids, your, nucle uh, your nuclear DNA, your mitochondrial DNA, or damage your proteins. And if you take antioxidants, that should alleviate that. But it's never worked out, right? So why is that? So, it could be we haven't designed the right antioxidant, but it could be because as the respiratory chain of mitochondria where all the electrons are going, right? You need electrons to make a superoxide and H2O2, that perhaps, perhaps these molecules are not always damaging, but they actually have a physiological or biological role, right? And now we know oh, a lot about, from our work and other works, that for example, this peroxide dependent signaling, we heard some great talks already about immunology, they're very important for innate and adaptive of, uh, immunity. So in other words, if you give if mitochondrial targeted antioxidants, your macrophages or your T cells don't do what they're supposed to do. You become immunosuppressive, right? So that might explain why sometimes antioxidants aren't good for you. Uh, and, uh, one of the, uh, the ways we think H2O2 does it, it, the cysteine residues of proteins can be oxidized. Now I'll tell you something that's been completely unsatisfactory for the last 20 years we've been working on this, is that how does it all work, right? It, I mean, in other words, how do you get from H2O2 to oxidation of cysteines, which then change this activity of the protein and to cause cellular differentiation, as I'll show you. We don't have good insight into that. Right? But you know, I did a, it was a philosophical decision when we started working on this. Either we can try to mechanistically figure out all these targets, or we can just take a very simple approach in my lab and continuously go in many systems, whether it's in stem cells, immune cells, cancer cells, uh, 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 neuro, neurons, and just try to show this general paradigm that mitochondria can work as signaling organelles beyond energy and biosynthetic capability hydrogen peroxide to make a stem cell be functional or a T cell be functional or a neuron to, uh, uh, for neurotransmission. And, uh, and so one way to sort of put this, our data, with the historic data going back almost 50 or 60 years ago, people like Linus Pauling who thought a lot about reactive oxygen species is, yeah, you can get, you can, sorry, go back, there you go, you can get to mitochondrial a little reactive oxygen species at a level that will damage, okay? You can do that, right? Especially if you take a toxin, and you can, you can get to those high levels. But most of biology, we think, is, is in this range. So we always think just about every cell that has a mitochondria other than red blood cells always is emitting a little bit of hydrogen peroxide, which is absolutely necessary for the function and maintenance of that cell. What I mean by that is, for example, if you're a T cell, and I give it a an mitochondrial targeted antioxidant or genetically disable that and drive those ROS to really low levels or stem cells or any other cell, neurons, that cell stops functioning. It stops doing what its professional job is to do. 
O. So it's absolutely critical for homeostasis of a cell a function. And then under hypoxia or TNF or whenever you receive some sort of uh, uh, stress, it, you can all increase ROS levels like a signaling molecule above the threshold to activate adaptive genes which help you adapt to that stress. Yes, and of course, it's at some level, it's too much, and a cell can either go death or senescence. So uh, why is the system hardwired this way? Okay, so we actually think, uh, and Kathy was uh, very nicely talking about uh, um, how uh, you had to have cell junctions to get multicellularity. Hey, I could make the same argument about mitochondria, but, forget, but even going further back, if you think about early in evolution and, and how the first eukaryote was selected for, what we know from all this wonderful molecular data now is it's a combination of an alpha proteobacterium bacteria, which is now the present-day mitochondria, and archaea, which is the other host. And the two sort of, of exchanged metabolites, and when they exchanged metabolites was the genesis of the first eukaryote. And thinking about what metabolites an alpha proteobacteria does, and we work on one that looks like present-day mitochondria, I can tell you the two products they do release is acetate and hydrogen peroxide, and throughout the prokaryotic kingdom and eukaryotic kingdom, the two oldest and universally conserved post-translational modifications are obviously lysine acetylation and thiol oxidation of cysteines. It's conserved in every organism. You can see it, right? right? So we think early in evolution, this is how the alpha proteobacteria uh, conveyed signals. And this thing now has been hardwired. And you know, looking back almost 20 years ago since we started working on mitochondria signaling organelles, was from our initial work on hydrogen peroxide, now there's actually a lot of people working on this. It's in different ways. So beyond hydrogen peroxide, there's metabolites that can be released. Membrane potential can change. Uh, the, the tethering of mitochondria to, for example, ER, these are called mitochondrial-associated membranes, this can work as a signaling platform for immune cells, for example. Oh, and and uh, there's a whole field of mito for the cell biologist, there's a whole field of mitochondria sort of hugging and kissing each other constantly and moving away and getting together, uh, as well as moving in different places in the cell uh, uh, because they need to do that to, I think, to give their signals at the right place in the cell, right? So there's a whole cell biology aspect beyond biochemistry. So my lab is actually divided into three parts. One part works on metabolic adaptation, one part works on proliferation, and one part works on differentiation. And for today, eh, what I want to talk to you about is uh, uh, cellular differentiation. And, and it's really a, 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 a simple question we ask is, does the differentiation require mitochondrial generated hydrogen peroxide as signaling molecules? And the model that I'm going to show you is the model, of uh, obviously, of skin. I have to be honest with you, I know very little about skin. I lived in Miami a long time ago, so I have appreciation of skin. But other than that, <clears throat> I don't know much about skin. But I tell you who does, Robert Lafker. Many of you know Robert Lafker, a pioneer in skin and hair biology. The other guy who knows it who's here is Spiro Getzios uh, and, uh, and Kara, who helped us a little bit on the beta catena. But really, uh, uh, I, you know, I'm not trying to be humble or modest. I really don't know much about skin biology. But, but this is where having, uh, as Kathy was saying, sticking together helps because uh, Robert and Spiro are the real, uh, 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 my intellectual mentors in guiding uh, uh, me through this project. So uh, how did we get into this? So it came from a very simple observation that Catherine Tormos in my lab made and, uh, when she first got to the lab, where she just took some stem cells, and then she could differentiate a variety of stem cells in culture. And I'll show you the one that she did. And she just noticed. A simple assay, you measure mitochondrial function, oxygen consumption, right? Something that we can all understand. And low oxygen consumption in stem cells, very high in differentiated cells. So we started thinking about uh, what does that mean? And, and, you know, in the literature, what everybody said was, well, yeah, that absolutely happens. And, and the reason it happens is, uh, is because the transcription factors is that take any stem cell to a differentiated cell, whatever those lineage-specific transcription factors are, are, they turn on metabolic genes. You know, on those gene arrays, if you go back, if you study this, one of the highest, uh, cha the, the, one of the most differential changes you see between stem cell or progenitors and their differentiated counterparts are metabolic genes. 
they are the most enriched ones over and over, right? And, and so she could do something like this. For example, she could take undifferentiated mesenchymal, human primary bone marrow mesenchymal stem cells, and Catherine could make these into beautiful structures here, right? And, uh, and these adipocytes uh, that she generated are full of mitochondria. And so everybody who looks at this says, well, duh, that's what adipocytes do. That's what a liver does, right? They need mitochondria. Uh, so that's not so interesting, right? If, they, if the mitochondria are only there to fulfill bioenergetic and biosynthetic capabilities of an adipocyte, eh, I'm not as interested. But what she luckily found was the following thing, thing which is that early on, so by the time you get these lipids, it's like 10 days. Within hours, you could see increase in mitochondrial generated H2O2, and this was necessary completely required, not sufficient, then, to turn on uh, PPAR gamma and CEBP alpha, which is the classical adipogenic transcriptional machinery for an adipocyte. And so this was really nice because this sort of set up a conceptual paradigm. This paper was published in Cell Metabolism years ago, uh, which was we think that a stem cell uh, or a progenitor, when it has to go to a differentiated system, it activates a little bit of peroxide signaling as a signaling molecule uh, 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 upstream of transcriptional machinery. In my lab, anytime we can show the requirement of mitochondria turning on or off anything in the nucleus, we get excited, whether it's genes, epigenetic, etc. Uh, if it's downstream of epigenetic or transcriptional changes, I don't care. It's not as interesting to me. Either. Okay, so Robert Hamanaka, who uh, a very talented postdoc and uh, who's a junior faculty at the University of Chicago, uh, uh, worked with Catherine uh, and helped her out quite a bit. Uh, he was a postdoc, she was a graduate student, and he started to think, gee, it'd be nice to test this in vivo, right? Because Catherine's study was done only in vitro. Oh, and how could we test this? So we had a conditional knockout of a, a gene called TFAM. Okay? It is a gene that is nuclear encoded but it's necessary for mitochondrial DNA replication. So what does that mean? That means that, that, that when you knock out TFAM, right, you knock out mitochondrial DNA, and these complexes, they fail. They don't work now. Okay, so this is like the hammer. You know, this is a way to the, ablate mitochondria. Physically, they're there, but functionally, they're not there. So this is a simple way to ask, are mitochondria important, right? It, two caveats, you don't make ATP, and you don't make ROS, okay? That's important for the interpretation in a second. And, and so we did the classical thing where you take this, you cross it to one K14 Cree, hey, as long as you can get good recombination of TFAM, you can conditionally knock it out wherever you want, in this case, in the skin, right? And, and very easy to genotype, right? They're hairless, right? And, and uh, within two, three weeks, they die. So. Here's as the mouse sort of grows, and this mouse, and in fact, one of the things that Rob noticed was that as he would pick them up, the skin was quite loose, yes? and then he dumped them in toluene blue to look at the uh, epidermal uh, barrier function, and the barrier function was as, uh, compromised as well. So the first thing he did, got together with uh, Spiro and Robert, they said, well, you should at least look at the skin to look at some classical differentiation markers, and they were down. So then you start to think, well, of course, duh. You knocked out mitochondria, the cells are dead. Uh, so he did a, uh, a clever experiment, and which is he BRDU oh, pulsed the cells and just looked in the basal cells to see there. Uh, and this is what he found. They were actually hyperproliferating. That got us super excited. Why? Simple reason. From a, from a metabolism point of view, to go from one cell to two daughter cells, think about it. You go from one cell to two daughter cells. Imagine the amount of new lipids, nucleotides, protein. This is a massive anabolic program to grow, right? They can do this. They figured a way out in vivo to grow. But they just couldn't differentiate. And that started to tell us, wait a second, this couldn't be just a defect in bioenergetics or biosynthetic because they can proliferate, but they can't differentiate. It, to me, starts to smell like signaling, and we get excited, right? Hey, and so uh, he takes some epidermal lysates uh, in vitro, I mean in vivo, and in vitro he can do a calcium switch. And what he notices is that the notch, which is one of the dominant transcription factors that regulates epidermal differentiation, at least in, uh, in mice, is the, the, the targets of notch uh, uh, were down. 
Um, and then if you look at some of the, the classical keratin markers of differentiation, and, and you can see K1 and uh, K10 in vitro, oh, in the TFAM nulls, there's this huge decrease in, uh, in the induction of the Importantly, just to show you our cells are not completely dysfunctional, we just throw in an activated notch, which is this notch uh, ICD, an activated notch. And look, K1 is down here. We give the activated notch, it comes back. These cells are functional at some level, right? They can turn on genes. They're alive. They just don't have, we don't think, the right signals. And so, uh, Again, uh, we can uh, ex vivo culture cells, the basal cells. We give them a calcium switch, and as you can see, all the differentiation markers are down, right? So remember I told you that the caveat in the interpreting our experiments is they, these cells don't make ATP from mitochondria. They rely purely on glycolysis, and glycolysis, in fact, can um, uh, uh, compensate for the, for the uh, lack of ATP from mitochondria for survival. So how do we figure out, is it the H2O2, the lack of H2O2, and I'm not showing you that we measured it, H2O2 is down, or is it the ATP? So we can do a simple rescue experiment, right? And here's our rescue experiment right here. So if the simple idea is whatever the, you know, the variety of signals when you do the calcium switch, we think are going to the mitochondria to make peroxide, which is necessary for cellular differentiation. And, and we can actually come um, and have a simple trick, which is where we give galactose oxidase and galactose. You don't have to worry about the biochemistry, but that reaction makes H2O2. And we can do it in nanomolar amounts. I just have to jack up the galactose oxidase or the galactose. I can make nanomolar, micromolar, millimolar amounts, right? And so I can t uh, titrate it. I should say not I, Robert Hamanaka can titrate it. And so you can see, for example, wild type cells, those will uh, nicely differentiate. And here are the nice markers, right? And so you do this calcium switch, you see these robust markers. The T fam nulls have much less markers. And all he's doing now, is just titrating in H2O2. And you can see the markers come back. Now, the amount of ATP being generated in the wild type is high from mitochondria, and the TFAM nulls is zero. Oh, and by giving this treatment of H2O2, they're still making no ATP. Right? We're not fixing that problem. All we're doing is just giving the one thing that we think they might be lacking for signaling, which is peroxide. Right? So this was a, quite a gratifying uh, experiment. And what about the reverse? If you take a, if this idea is correct at some level, then a wild type cell, which can make peroxide from mitochondria, if you gave it a mitochondrial targeted antioxidant, right? would that prevent cellular differentiation in that context? And so you can see, here's the wild type cells, those differentiating. TPP is basically a cation. So mitochondria pump hydrogen ions. They're the most negative potential in the cell. If you give a cation, they rapidly accumulate it into the mitochondria. Uh, this is vitamin E. You guys can all know about vitamin E. And this is mitovitamin E, which is vitamin E hooked up to TPP. And you can see, the mitochondrial targeted antioxidant really diminishes the cellular differentiation markers and not signaling and all the other things that I'm not showing you. Oh, so in a wild type cell, if we take away mitochondrial generated ROS, you can prevent cellular differentiation. If you knock out mitochondrial function, you don't do cellular differentiation, but all you have to do is give back a little peroxide it, it, and uh, they come back. Right? And so in the interest of time, I, I don't have time. Um, uh, um, I don't want to be between you and your lunch date. So uh, I didn't go into this, but we could also show uh, not only that uh, early on you need H2O2 for not signaling to get this uh, epidermal differentiation, but also for hair follicle growth. As many of you know, Robert Lafker is a pioneer in this biology. So Robert really helped us nicely figure out some of the dynamics of it. And Kara Gattardi is well known for her beta-catenin work, helped us link it to beta-catenin, which is one of the, uh, at least in mice, uh, is a, is a um, a dominant regulator of hair follicle growth. But I think, um, obviously, uh, many of you are interested in skin biology. But beyond skin biology, I think, uh, as a general paradigm, we think uh, when, when you think about cellular differentiation, whatever system you're working on, and that there might be changes in meta metabolism that are upstream 
of the lineage specific transcription factors, right? So uh, like the hematopoiesis system has all these transcription factors which take progenitors into different places, whether it's a monocyte, whether it's a lymphocyte, it, whether it's a neutrophil, whether it's an erythrocyte. And we think that metabolism can actually be a driver for those changes upstream of the epigenetic and, uh, and uh, 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 genetic changes. So, if you were sleeping through my lecture and now you're getting ready to go for lunch, please just remember one idea, which is that we think mitochondrial metabolism, and beyond probably H2O2 in other ways, is, is causal. Well, it's just not a consequence. It's just not a bystander sitting in the background, but it's actually an active dominant player in dictating biological phenotypes, right? Um, and so where are we going uh, uh, in the future, right? So I want to just, uh, I always tell the students that, believe it or not, uh, most of us uh, who come up with these models, they tend to be models. It takes about at least minimum five, sometimes 10, sometimes 15 years to know if you're actually correct. So the only thing in life you should get credit for is asking a good question. And, and who knows if you're going to be right or wrong, because technology changes is you get more rigorous in how you test it. So, so far, all we've been able to do is just knock out mitochondrial function, do these sort of ex vivo rescue experiments. And what we would really like to do, and we're doing this now uh, with the next generation of genetically engineered mice, is to uncouple well, the bioenergetics, biosynthetic, and the signaling, the three roles that mitochondria do from each other, right? Hey, and, and why do I say this? Without getting into the biochemistry, as many of you remember, the bioenergetics which generates ATP is coupled to the biosynthetic activity by these reducing equivalents. So anytime someone knocks out, like we did, electron transport chain, you also knock out biosynthetic activity. You also knock out signaling. So how do you know it's the ATP from the energy, uh, sorry, from the biosynthetic, from the signaling, right? Because it's all coupled. All we can do are those rescue ex vivo experiments. In fact, I'm going to say something that you'll probably all remember more than anything else in my talk, which is that there's no evidence that anyone's ever presented in a mammalian system that mitochondrial ATP is necessary to sustain life. I know, right? It's funny, but... but if you really think about it carefully, and I'm not trying to be cute or clever here by saying that, what do I mean by that? Because if I come in and I knock out uh, electron transport chain, everybody says, oh, you don't make ATP, that's why your mice are dead. Well, how do you know that? Because when you knock out electron transport chain, this guy doesn't work. And you don't make ROS. How do you, how do you know that, right? All the mitochondrial knockouts die at 9.5. HIF-1 knockout dies at 9.5 as well. Coincidence? I don't know, right? So we're trying to figure out how we can uncouple it, and the greatest experiment in my lab right now is to show mitochondrial ATP is not necessary for life. It's a bet. The second one, which has been very unsatisfactory so far, is this idea. How does it all work, right? I mean, the people who've done kinase biology, eh, eh, you know, they can always show you a nice substrate being phosphorylated, dephosphorylated. Right? A, a dear friend of mine who's well known for his work in, um, in, in kindness, uh, he says to me, you know, Nav, if you don't have a mechanism, just say it's ROS, right? You give an antioxidant, it always works. Uh, part of it is, he's right, is, is you know, is we don't know all the targets. So this is the next wave as well uh, to convince the broader biologist. It's, finally, I want to uh, just again reiterate uh, much of the work I showed is by uh, Robert Hamanaka. Robert uh, just left the lab, a uh, very talented uh, postdoc who uh, he really, did, like I know basic biochemistry, that's about it, but uh, he really learned it. And uh, like I said, these were uh, uh, Lafka, uh, Getzius, and, uh, and Kara were really the intellectual mentors who guided him through this process. Finally, I've got about three seconds left. I'm going to do a shameless plug. Uh, because it took a year out of my life, which is I wrote a book. Why did I write a book? So for most of you who've grown up with the legendary Leninger textbook like I did, or Stryer, and now you, you, know, you go, you open up uh, all the journals, there's something on metabolism. Um, so where do you go right now? You go to those two books. X, with all due respect to the late Leninger and, and Stryer's still alive, these books are amazing. They're boring as hell. Why are they boring? Because they just tell you the biochemistry. 
And you don't care about the biochemistry. You care only if you can see how it relates to the rest of biology. So this is a book uh, written uh, uh, called uh, Navigating Metabolism. Uh, and uh, uh, the best part about this book is not my writing. I'm actually not a very good writer. That's the ironic part about it. The best part about the book is P. Jeffs, who did these amazing drawings. I mean, these drawings really make metabolism come to life. And I know the drawings are amazing because little children mistake them for coloring books, as Ralph Deberdinas' daughter did, and this is what she did to the first page. <laughs> Maybe it's my first critique of the book, but uh, nevertheless, uh, thank you for your patience and enjoy lunch. <laughs>